All right, let's talk aerial refueling. No gas, no glory. So the Air Force and the Navy have fundamentally different approaches to aerial refueling. The Air Force views the tanker as the male and the receiving aircraft as the female, where the Navy views that 180 out, meaning the tanker is the female and the receiving aircraft is the male. So if you're a Navy airplane looking for gas from an Air Force tanker, obviously you have to make sure it's configured to give gas to a Navy airplane. And I can tell you on some missions that was an issue. Flaming out because you did poor fuel planning is not a good option. So you paid a lot of attention to your fuel. The pilot gauge had fuel flow. You can see here the two main fuel flow left and right motor and that's in thousands of pounds per hour and the Rio just had a totalizer. So you're working together, talking about it and making sure that you're always on or above your, your fuel ladder. And if you're not, then you have to adjust either more judicious with throttle movements, no afterburner, stop the dog fighting that you're doing, whatever. And then, as I said, in extreme conditions or extremist conditions, you either divert or if a divert isn't possible, if you're blue water ops, then you do an emergency pull forward, which is very much bad form and something you want to avoid. So proper judicious fuel planning is key. So think about that as we're talking about the mechanics of in-flight refueling. Now for my first two deployments, they were to the Mediterranean and the only tankers I saw were what we call organic tankers, which were tankers that were part of the air wing. So I tanked off KA-6s, A-7s that were configured for the tanking mission and S-3s. So these were all airplanes that were pretty easy to tank off of. They had hose and drogue, take up reels. That's a, a, a docile apparatus. Um, and so it was kind of no big deal. As the nature of my deployments changed post desert storm, meaning we would sortie through the Mediterranean, go through the Suez Canal and spend a lot, if not most of our time in the Persian Gulf, the nature of the tanking that we did changed. We were doing longer range missions. And so that was the first time that I saw Air Force tankers. So this was my third and fourth and fifth deployments. And we were doing an operation called Southern Watch. And Southern Watch was the patrolling of the no-fly zone in southern Iraq, south of the 33rd parallel, to enforce the UN sanctions on Saddam. So these were double and triple cycle missions. We were airborne for upwards of four hours plus. And you would tank during these missions off of Air Force tankers three and four times. In many ways, like landing on the boat at night, aero refueling on the heavy tanker with a number of airplanes on either wing at night while doing Operation Southern Watch missions was the most dangerous part of that operation. In fact, on my last deployment, we lost two Hornets, they had a mid-air in the pattern while trying to rendezvous on the tanker and the pilot of one of the Hornets was killed. So a typical Operation Southern Watch mission would start with you getting the air tasking order and the air tasking order, ATO, came out of Joint Task Force Southwest Asia located in Riyadh. So you would read the air tasking order if you had an Operation Southern Watch mission and see who were you tanking off of. And so there were basically two types of tankers, U.S. Air Force tankers, KC-10s, which had the nice big hose and drogue, like a soft pillow, very gentle system, 
and the KC-135, which had a bolt-on hose and drogue that we called the wrecking ball. It did not have a take-up reel. And so this was dicey and something that we had to get used to, especially when we had just started flying in the Gulf. It was known to take off a lot of probe doors and also probe tips, if not the entire probe. So launch, and you would immediately head to the tanker. So I have our training aids here. Trusty F-14A, and then in this case, I'm gonna use the 777, the KLM 777, to simulate your generic Air Force tanker. All right, so you'd know what the tanker track was, where it was. It would be annotated on the airplane, or the ATO rather. Generally for Operation Southern Watch missions, it was a 10 mile racetrack over Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. So launch, rendezvous through wingman, and go find the tanker. So you'd be under E2 control, you know, your organic airborne early warning aircraft, and he would hand you off to the AWACS when you got closer, which is the, the Air Force airborne early warning aircraft. And you'd pick up the tanker via radar operating on the tanker track. So where you picked him up, you didn't know. Are you chasing him from behind? Is he coming at you? The other thing you were never really sure of is how many airplanes are on the tanker's wing at any given time. So sometimes you would get there and there'd be literally five airplanes on both wings, which, you know, is pretty sporty. So this is where Rio comes in handy and you'd paint the picture and figure out whether you had to kind of get separation for a rendezvous or whether you were chasing him down. Eventually, as you got close enough, the pilot would get a tally and we'd affect our rendezvous. So you take your place in the line. Again, you might be number five or six on the wing. And when it came your time to tank, after waiting patiently, you'd say whatever your Operation Southern Watch call sign was, and they would differ from the tactical call signs. So let's say we're called Yankee. So Yankee 1, port observation, 5,000 pounds, nose cold. Nose cold means I have my radar in standby. So when I slide back behind you, I'm not going to be lighting you up. So, and he would say, Roger, go to pre-contact. And so you'd just slide back, pre-contact. You'd get just behind the drogue. And you'd say, Yankee 1, pre-contact. And this time, now you're talking to the, the boomer in the back of the Air Force tanker, KC-10 or KC-135. And he'd say, cleared contact. And so now you'd make your approach to the basket. So like landing on the boat, like other things that are challenging for fighter pilots, there's a technique. So if you look at this video here, it's an F-14 tanking off of a Lockheed TriStar. And you can see the pilot is working very hard and he's jousting a little bit with the drogue. So he has great patience. The Rio's most likely giving him some sugar calls here. And what he does right is if you miss, just back away and try again. So sometimes you get out of phase with the basket and chasing it is not a good idea as you can see here. Sometimes 
it walks over the nose on the wrong side, which happens here as well. Sometimes it looks like it's going to get stuck inside the probe and the fuselage. So this guy does a good job of hang back, try again. So here he goes again. At this point, if I was the Rio, I'd be saying right, 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 right. Come right, come right. Okay, forward, forward. Good plug. Okay, you see the take up reel, you drive the basket forward a little bit. And now you're looking for some gas and you want to see good flow. So great job by the pilot there after a few attempts. So the thing about how you make the airplane maneuver to get the plug, up is not this, up is this. And right is not move the stick to the right, right is right rudder. So if you're using the stick, you're going to be chasing the basket and you'll never plug. So what senior pilots, seasoned pilots would discover is the best way to plug is to chase it and have a trend that was up and right. So just right rudder, right rudder, a little bit of left wing down, and then just watch it plug and anticipate also that the bow wave of the Tomcat nose making the basket walk away. So anticipate that motion. But if you're, if it's not happening, meaning some, you'd be in turbulence and the, the basket be jumping around. I mean, I had some crazy days where the basket was all over the place and we were convinced we were never going to tank. Now, sometimes when you joust with the tanker, particularly the KC-135. Uh, you'd wind up wearing the basket. And you can see a picture here of a Hornet that did just that. In my sophomore effort, Punk's Wing, I have a Nugget pilot named Muddy, female pilot, who's on her first deployment. And she's tanking on the KC-135 and she makes the hose taut, a little bit over reaction, and snaps the probe tip and winds up having to divert to Pakistan. So these things happen. The other thing that can happen is if you hit a probe and drogue like a KC-10 or a Lockheed TriStar, if you hit that drogue with too much forward mo movement, you can create a sine wave and the take-up reel can't accommodate it and so that sine wave will go down and come back and snap the basket off the probe. And again, you'll probably break the probe tip. You might fod the engine. You might snap the basket off. Like everything else, the more you do it, the more confident you become. It doesn't get any easier, but you become more proficient. So as crews went on, when we saw the KC-135 on the ATO, we didn't freak out like we did early on on a, on a deployment. So now there is a brave new world of tanking coming. It's the Stingray, the MQ-25 is in development. It's an unmanned tanker that is based on the carrier. So it will do mobility tanking, recovery tanking, and it will also do mission tanking. And it's going to reduce the wear and tear on the Super Hornets, because Super Hornets are being used now, and Growlers are being used now, as the A7s and the S3s were during my time in the fleet. And it's expending a lot of flight hours and, and wear and tear on, on these airplanes. So we want to get Super Hornets and Growlers out of that business and find a utility for the MQ-25. And they've landed on in-flight refueling. So that's kind of the brave new world of in-flight refueling. It'll be interesting, exciting, amazing to watch an unmanned aircraft work with manned aircraft, launching, landing, tanking, mission tanking, 
I just can't imagine taxiing around the flight deck with an unmanned vehicle or being behind the JBD and watching an unmanned vehicle go down the cat in front of me. That, that I just can't see in my mind's eye, but that's what's coming. All right, that'll do it for this episode. I thank you for your support. We're over 13,000 subscribers. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell. Become a subscriber. I love the comments. The likes are very important. So thanks for all of the support. I very much appreciate it, and I'll talk to you again soon.